Michelle and I often t tune into different Torah uh, shows on YouTube and um, we're just amazed, and we shouldn't be really, but we're amazed at how like our, our father's just miraculously day after day bringing his children together from all over the world, you know. And this has been going on for um, a few decades now. It may be new to a lot of us, but it's been going on for a while now. And it really did boom with the advent of internet. You know, but it, it just doesn't, from every race, every nationality, every uh, every uh, country, all over the world, it's just, it's just, the, it's proof of like what, what, what our Lord has prophesied all along, you know, he will gather his children together. And we're actually seeing it, you know, we, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. And even in our just uh, humble fellowship here, we see people from different parts of the UK and even different parts of the world right here, right now, you know, it's beautiful. So we're... Uh, Hallelujah, we thank you, Lord. Amen. What a privilege and an honour it is to be uh, together, you know, uh, before our Lord has instructed. Okay, so today we're on um, Pasha Vayelech. Pasha Vayelech. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to remind us all of uh, our creed here at Almond House. Um, it's based on the Bible, obviously. It's... It's basically the creed of the Bible, you know. Um, and we base it on mainly on the Shema and on um, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13. The Shema and 1 Corinthians 13. And the Shema goes like this. Shema Yisrael, Yahavah Elechenu, Yahavah Echad. Ve'echavta Yahavah Elechecha, Vakal Levavcha, Uvakal Nefshecha, Uvakal Meodecha. We have to la rayacha kamocha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Amen. Amen. And also in 1 Corinthians 13, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13 and this is the ISR version, which uh, is my personal preference. Love is patient, is kind. Love does not envy, love doesn't boast, love's not puffed up. It doesn't behave indecently, does not seek its own, is not provoked, reckons not the evil, and does not rejoice over the unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love covers all, believes all, expects all, endures all. Love never fails. And God is love. God is love. So that's our creed. So today, Vayelech, Pasha Vayelech, as it's spoken in Hebrew, yeah, that's the Hebrew title, Vayelech. In English, it would be, and went. But as it's referring to Moses, it's, and he went. And this word, Vayelech, it comes from the verb, Halach, which itself means to walk or to go, or even how to live one's life, how one lives their life how they walk through life. And it's the same verb that we see in the, way back in Genesis, I think it's the third Torah portion, Lech Lecha, with um, Abraham, or Abram at the time. And here today, the Pasha title itself is the very first word, Vayelech Moshe and Moses went, and then it says, and spoke these words to all Israel. And then we, we may think, well, Moses went where? Because it says Moses went. You think Moses went where? Went? Where? Where did he go? Well, the answer is he went wherever God said. That's what Moses did. He went wherever God said to go. Wow. That's what Moses did. Hallelujah. Same as Abraham. Abraham and Moses, as best as they could, walked or lived their lives out in accordance with the will of God. Mm -hmm. However difficult, or unfair or even perplexing that God's will, God's will may have appeared, they obeyed. Not my will, but yours, Father. And that should remind us of a certain somebody. Uh, so let's review where we're up to now. Uh, last week in Parson Nitzavim, Jacko did a wonderful job in, in outlining how the words of Moses are intended for every generation including for this generation and future generations to come. 
So what we read is thousands of years old and it's applicable today and tomorrow. And this week, in Parsha Vayelech, we continue that theme, how the truth of the word is forever and it's applicable for all time. This Parsha is a beautiful and powerful Parsha. It's actually the shortest Parsha in the whole of the Torah cycle. <laughs> Isn't it, Jacko? It's, um, it's, um, there are a few that are only a chapter long. They're only a chapter in length, but this is the shortest chapter of the Torah cycle, eight Parshas. It's only 30 verses long. Yeah, it, it might be worth noting that it's quite a special year this year because usually the short ones like this that are only 30 years, 30 verses long, 30 years, they're actually paired up. So next year we'll probably see double Parshas. Yeah. So I, I think it's been a real blessing this year to just have them all... Go through on, on steadily in a, yeah. Yeah, in a steady manner too. Yeah, because this w normally would have been paired up with last week's Nitzavim, mm. Nitzavim and Vayelech, for example. Yeah, you're right, bro. But because we um, we we conform our Torah cycle with the, the Hebrew calendar, and in the Hebrew calendar, it's it's a it's a leap year now, is it? Yeah. Yeah, and the, as in the English, the English calendar is every four years there's a leap year, but I think in the the Hebrew calendar, it's there's seven out of every 19 or something. It's a, a, quite a bit, different. Yeah, yeah. We've got a bit more wiggle room this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a single Parsha this week, and it's the shortest in the Torah reading cycle. And it's strange, isn't it, really? Because we read in, uh, in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 how in God's mercy, he, the end times are shortened because there's so much stuff we don't like going on that he's shortened the times in his mercy, you know. Time is, in effect, sped up. And um, the Torah cycle seems to replicate this, you know. We, um, the final few parsha, parashot, the, the, they're more or less only approximately a chapter each, wow. you know. And if you compare that with the very first parsha, Bereshit, which is six chapters long, you know, it's uh, the last few parsha, it's like... Doo -doo 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 -doo. And then you've reached the end all of a sudden, you're at the end, you know. It seems to replicate um, our, 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 our Lord's calendar. It's curious that, Tom, because when Yeshua says, Behold, I come quickly, the word quickly is takios. It's where we get a tachometer, tachometer the Greek, yes. for measuring speed. Uh -huh. And as something gets closer to the end, it speeds up. Yes, So it course, yeah. gains what's called velocity. So yeah. in this time, we will feel velocity, you know. We will feel like the weeks are going quicker. This is the hour, and yeah. time is of uh -huh. the essence. It's yeah. getting quicker. It's, it's God's natural laws of physics. If you drop a stone from a great height, it starts off going a certain speed, but by the time before it hits the ground, it's travelling at a phenomenal speed. The nearer something gets to its target, the faster it goes. Yeah, so the this is a chapter long. It's only 30 verses. And it replicates the end times, where time seems to be getting shorter and faster, like Joe said. And um, Bereshit is six chapters long in comparison, where in the beginning people lived for hundreds of years, you know. Time was slower. Um, and so time seemed longer. And now that we're living uh, in the end times, lives are shorter and time seems to go by faster, you know. So a brief summary of um, today's Parsha. Uh, Moses announces that Joshua, Yehoshua, same name as same name as Jesus, Yehoshua, Joshua, is to succeed Moses as the leader of the nation. Um, then we re then we were told that the Torah is to be read out after every seven years. Then we see that Joshua is inaugurated as the new leader, and then um, it culminates this part with this <coughs> Moses reciting the song of Moses which we don't read till actually the next Parsha. <coughs> now this Vayelech, it's the first portion in Moses' last day on earth. So we have Vayelech and then we have two more Parashot, all featuring Moses' last day on earth. Wow. And this is the first section of that. Moses' words are godly and are as applicable now as they ever were. A foreshadow of our Saviour, Yeshua. There was none like Moses. As I say, this Parsha, Vayelech, and the next two, Ha'azinu, and Vezot Habarcha, 
describe the events and words spoken on the last day of Moses' life. It's quite important to bear that in mind that it is Moses' last day. Uh, so let's read Parsha of Ayalech. It's chapter 31, Deberim, or Deuteronomy. Then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also, the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites and their land, when he destroyed them. The Lord will give them over to you, that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenants of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law and that their children who've not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you crossed the Jordan to possess. Mm, then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tabernacle of meeting that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of meeting. Now the Lord appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood above the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlots with the gods of the foreigners of the land, where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenants which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And I will surely hide my face in that day, because of all the evil which they have done, in that they have turned to other gods. Now therefore write down this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Pull it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, and they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behaviour today, even before I brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. Therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. Then he inaugurated Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and of good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them and I will be with you. So it was, when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenants of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenants of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. 
If today, while I'm yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Small partial but a packs a punch, doesn't it? You know, small but a packs a punch. So we read here now, it's, it's Moses' last day on earth. It's, I mean, just, just pause for a moment and think about that if you were in his shoes. This is Moses' last day on earth. And he knows it, by the way. You know, it's not like he doesn't know it's his last day. Yeah. He knows it's his last day on earth. You know, so there's a big difference. God told him. There you go. Yeah. God told him. Thanks, bro. And it's his birthday. He's 120 on this day. You know. So I'm reading this and thinking, can you imagine that? He, what would you do if you knew it was your last day on earth? You know, I'll, we're going to touch on that in the parish. Someone once asked me, when do you think Judgment Day is going to be? And I said, every day. You know, and that's how we should really live. Because um, every day is Judgment Day, you know. <clears throat> we don't know when it's going to be our last day. When we wake up in the morning, it's a brand new day. It's creation again. It's recreation, you know. We ought to give thanks to Yah for, for life itself. Even thanks and praise when we wake up in the morning. Every day when we rise, it's a brand new day. It's as if it were the first day of our life. It truly is. It's like it's the first day again. We should give thanks and praise and glory and honour to our God for this. Not take it lightly. And then we're supposed to live it as if it were our, as if it were our last day on earth. We should treat others as if it's the last time we're going to see them. You might, ne you might never get another opportunity to do so. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, bro. It. Some say that on his last day, Moses went from tribe to tribe, from tent to tent, extolling the virtues of Torah and a life with God and for God. On his last day, and the question remains, what would you do on your last day? What would you do on your last day? It's something really to contemplate and to meditate on. Kasab. What would you do if you knew this is your last day on earth? So whatever we do, whatever day it is, let's bless others. Let's uplift others with love and with God's truth. Just as Moses did here. Let's look at verse 2. Moses says, I can no longer go out and come in. It's because God said so. It wasn't because he was in fame or anything. He was as fit as he was when he was 40. When he says, I can no longer go out and come in, it's because God said so. Mm -hmm. God told him, this is it now. Your time's up and it's Joshua's coming in. You know, God has a set time for everything. And Moses had to depart the scene and Joshua was going to enter the scene. So it wasn't because he was old and infirm, it's because God said so. That's why he no longer goes in and comes out. This is obedience. And we get the proof of um, Moses' state of health in Deuteronomy 34. His eye had not dimmed, nor had he lost his natural moisture. His faculties were still intact even on that final day, his last day. So when we see him saying, I can no longer, it means I am not permitted, basically. Um, authority was taken from him and given to Joshua. And like Abraham, Moses walked in obedience, as we've spoken of before. Plus, when we think about it, he's 120. He's led the people for 40 years now. 
almost perfectly, almost perfectly. God's still testing Moses. He's still testing him. Moses is still being tested, even on his very last day, after everything he's done as well. We all have free will. God has given us free will. He hasn't made us like robots. By his love and his mercy and his grace, he's given us all free will. We can choose life or death. He's given us the free will choice. And it even applied to Moses as well. God had told him, you're going to die today. You know, I'm mostly thinking, well, I want to cross over the river. And God says, no, you're not going to be doing the cross of them over. He could have just said, you know what, I'm going to. I'm going to cross them over. I've led them for 40 years. I'm going to cross them over. Um, I might have misheard you there, Lord, but I'm so maybe I've got it wrong. I'm just going to cross them over. He could have chose to cross them over. And later on when our Lord said, ascend the mountain where I'm going to close your life and then bury you somewhere, he could have just said, well, I'm not going up the mountain. He had free will still, you know. This is pure obedience. Mm -hmm. Moses is still being tested on his last day in, in real severe circumstances. If it were my last day, I don't, I'll probably have a birthday party. You know, I'm 120. I've achieved all this, by the way, you know. I've put up with this lot of years. I'm going to have a birthday. And you know what? I'm going to cross over as well to see what, what was the worst that can happen. You know? Oh, no. <laughs> so that's why it's not me and, it's, and it was Moses. It'll never be anyone like me. Beautiful, that, Tom. Deuteronomy 34 tells us his eye was not yet dim. And that can be a real spiritual insight to how obedient he truly was because Yeshua says, your eye must be full of light. If the eye is full of darkness how great that darkness could be it's the eye to the lamp of the body so he was still in tune with the most wow. high it's a good point so he wasn't just physically healthy he was spiritually he was still on the full top of, of the light. game he as well still full of light and he was still hydrated in thank the spirit as, it, as, it, as his skin was well he was still moistured yeah thank you wow. so he's still being tested and yet he still remains faithful and we we too had to remain faithful always i doubt we'll ever be tested as much as moses was but we have to remain faithful always till our last day. Now, if God says to you, no, I want you to go up this mountain, you think, yeah, okay. But what have you said? And then your, your life's going to end and I'm going to bury you somewhere. You're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. You know, Moses went up. Moses went up. We have to walk in obedience every day for life. And once we think, no, nah, I'm all right, I'm sorted, I've made it. That's when we begin to slide. Even Moses didn't do this. As high as Moses was, he never rested on his laurels. Once we think, yeah, I've done it, I'm all right, we start sliding. Mm. To be our best, we have to continually strive to improve. Mm. That's the only way. You stand still, you will go backwards. Mm -hmm. Everything will just overtake you. You will go backwards if you stand still. Um, there's a football team called Liverpool some of you might have heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, the reason they're the best football club in the world... <laughs> the reason they're the best football club in the world is because they never rest on their laurels. They can continually strive to improve. Even when at the top of the game, they still try to improve. And this is the example that Moses is setting us here. You know, he was on top of the game and yet he still wants to do better, wants to do more. Staying on this uh, verse two here, I can no longer go out and come in. Now we know, don't we, because we read the Parsha, we can week out. And we know that Yeshua is in every Parsha, you know. He's, he's right through the Torah, either in type or a foreshadowing or literally or in reference or figuratively, he's always there. He's always there, and he himself affirms this, doesn't he, in John 5. For if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote about me. Now, newcomers to Scripture can say, well, here's the first five books of Moses. Where does he mention Jesus here? Well, Yeshua himself says it. He wrote about me. Now, if we look what's going on here, I can no longer go out and come in, says Moses. So Moses departs the scene in order for Joshua to enter the scene. That's where we are in the Parsha. 
John 16. But I tell you the truth, it's better for you that I go away. For if I may not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. And if I go on, I will send him unto you. That's the YLT version. Moses departs the scene in order for Joshua to enter the scene. Yeshua has to depart the scene in order for the Holy Spirit to enter the scene. Moses equips us with God's Torah and Joshua leads us into the Promised Land. Moses represents the Torah and Joshua, Yahushua, Yahushua, the same name, represents Yeshua. But now that Moses was to depart, that didn't mean the end of the Torah. Moses himself here is exhorting the people to adhere to the Torah once they enter the Promised Land. He hasn't said, oh, stone with now, Joshua's going to take you in. Happy days. Forget the Torah now. He's showing them. He's exhorting the people to adhere to the Torah once they go into the Promised Land. It doesn't stop. The Torah is our trainer, which leads us to Messiah, and he takes us to the kingdom where the Torah still remains. This is what we're reading in the Parsha. Uh, moving on to verse 7. Then Moses called Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage. Now when someone speaks to you, and especially if they give you advice, depending on who they are and what they are about, you'll listen or you won't listen. You know, Or you'll heed or not heed, rather. Moses is able to speak and advise with conviction. He says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Because Moses was strong and of good courage. So we could speak with authority, with conviction, you know. If not, Joshua wouldn't have heeded him. If Moses wasn't what he, what he was, Joshua would have said, oh, whatever, are you, are you telling me? Imagine if I said to Joe, listen, Joe, you, you drive too fast. Don't, don't drive so fast, you know, just, just, you're driving too fast, like, it's not right. And yet I drive like there's no tomorrow, like a madman. Joe's just going to ignore me, and rightfully so. Because to talk the talk, I have to walk the walk. Moses walked the walk and he could talk the talk. And therefore Joshua listened and heeded what Moses spoke. We can't spread the truth of the word without living it. We have to live it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we're living a lie. Otherwise we're taking God's name in vain. Now, if you just go back one verse from seven to six here, Moses first says to Joshua before he says to the people, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid of them. And then he says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land. I'm wondering if, if Moses, you see, it's not just so much what you say, it's how you say something, isn't it, also, you know? That's why text, a text message can sometimes be a little bit, oh, why are they speaking like this when they're not speaking like that? It's just how you're reading it. But face to face with body language and a smile or whatever, the same words come, they're different, you know. So it's not just what we say, it's how we say it. And when Moses says to Joshua here, be strong and of good courage for you must go with his people to the land which the Lord has sworn. Did he say it like that or, he, or does he say, be strong and of good courage for you must go with this people. <laughs> In other words, you're going to need strength and courage to lead this lot. You know, I, I'm, I'm reading that and it's quite ambiguous, isn't it? You know, it's, it's just a thought, it's just a thought. But it's, that's the, the power of language, how it can be interpreted in different ways, you know. So, um, face to face is always better than the text. But yeah, is he saying, this people or this people? You better be strong, Joshua, because this people, <laughs> you know, you never know. It's just a thought anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't blame him, could you? You couldn't blame him. But um, God bless Moses. Up to verse 10 here. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in a year of release, at the Feast of Tabernacles, do, 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 do. at the end of seven years, i.e., this is the beginning of the eighth year. It's at the end of seven years, so you're, beginning the, you're on the cusp. You're on the cusp here of the, the end of the seventh, the beginning of the eighth. 
Now, eight stands for eternity. Now, this is the eternal year, what's going on here. At the end of seven, of seven years, you shall read this law before Israel in their hearing at the end of seven years. So going into eternity, you should, in other words, the Torah still stands. It's not just for that time then, or for those people there. It's for all time, even going into eternity here, it says. This is what it says in verse 10. At the end of seven years, and we know in God's time, you have the sixth thousand years, we have the seventh day, the millennial reign, and the eighth goes into eternity. The Torah still stands going into eternity. Amen. As Jesus, as Yeshua is the word in flesh, he said, um, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Beautiful. We're going into eternity. Will never pass away. Bless you, Joshua. The flower with us and the grass fades, but the word of the Lord endured. Hallelujah. There's many, there's many examples, and there's another one of verse 10. And also what we read here, here, verse 12. And the stranger. In other words, those who was grafted in were not all physical descendants of uh, the Yehudim. But here now, men, women, children, little ones, and the stranger. Praise Yah that he will bring us in, you know. Sticking with verse 12 here. And carefully observe all the words of this law. That's at the end of verse 12. So the stranger is included. That's us who are grafted in. And carefully observe all the words of this law. This is practically the same as Matthew 5 when Yeshua is speaking. When Yeshua says, Do not think that I, have come to, I came to destroy the Lord or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Where we see and carefully observe all the words of this law, it's observed to do, it's to fulfill. This is the same thing what Yeshua was speaking here in the Tanakh, in the Torah. To fulfill is to bring something into effect. As we know, Yeshua is the only one to do so completely. By the way, if you look at the following verse in Matthew, that was Matthew 5, 17, Yeshua was speaking. And in the following verse, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. The Spirit's moving, Joshua. I.e. the Torah stands forever. That's what Yeshua is saying. It stands forever. And forever means forever. And this jot here, for anyone who wants a uh, further proof that the scriptures were originally in Hebrew, this jot is the Hebrew letter Yod. If you look up jot in an English dictionary, it just means to note something down quickly. But its original meaning, if you look at the etymology of it, it's the letter Yod in Hebrew. It's the smallest letter in Hebrew. And this tittle is the smallest stroke of a letter in Hebrew. That's just a little... Uh, Hat tip, as Joel would say, to the, the fact that Hebrew is the original language of the scriptures. It wouldn't make sense in any other language. Jot and tittle is the Hebrew alphabet once again. Okay, back to the past. Here, verse 16. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers. In some versions, you will die and join your ancestors. Here, this is an affirmation of the afterlife. It's not a so-called New Testament which is a, a phrase I don't like to use. It's not a New Testament concept. Here it is right in the Tanakh. Affirmation of the next life. Moses is going to... The God's telling Moses, you will rest with your fathers. Well, his ancestors were buried in the same place as Moses. So you think, well, I thought Moses was going to go into some unknown grave. Well, yeah, but he's going with his ancestors. God's saying, you will rest with your ancestors. In other words, they're in a state of, as far as I'm concerned, they're still alive in a certain place and you're going to be with them. This is affirmation of the next life right here in the Tanakh. Not just in the Gospels, right there in the Tanakh. Verse 17. Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? In other words, the people, 
once again, they're not really taking responsibility for their own actions again. It's another way of saying, why doesn't he sort this out? Where is he? Why has he left us? That's what they're in effect saying. Why doesn't he sort this out? Where is he? Why has he left us? Like God's done something wrong. All this is happening because God isn't with us. He's left us, he's abandoned us. That's what they're basically saying. Now in life, we have to take responsibility for our own actions and not blame others. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a life skill lesson here. And we don't blame God when it's we who refuse to listen and obey him. Let's not blame God when we're refusing to listen and to obey him. He had to turn his face away from us because our conduct wasn't compatible with his holiness. It's our fault he turned his face away. Speaking about a life skill lesson, in every job I've ever had out in the world, the staff are constantly, constantly complaining about the managers and the managerial staff. Anyone who's got a job out in the world knows this. Oh, yeah. He's, he's put me on a such a such a shift. You know, then, you know, what's he doing? They're always going on about bosses and managers. You know, it's, it's, it's rife out there in the world. It really is. They're basically blaming other people for whatever they're going through. And this can't... It, it can be too easy to fall into if we're not careful, by the way, out there. You know, we've all experienced it. Most of us have. We need to be different and set apart. You know, we don't go along with that flow. We're in this world, but we're not of it. Okay, you'll see it, but don't be part of it. It's Lashon Hara. And this is what's happening in the past year. Where is he? Why doesn't he sort this out? He's left us. It's Lashon Hara. And it can happen. People blame others. They blame people that are close to them. They blame the wife, the husband, the friends. They blame the boss. Stop blaming others. Stop saying it's someone else's fault and take responsibility. Amen. And don't disobey God and then blame God when things go awry. That's the lesson here. We're continuing here, 17 and 18. It says, Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will, force, I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them. And then just further on, And I will surely hide my face in that day. This word hide or conceal, it's, it's repeated over those two verses. It's deliberately repeated, it's shown emphasis, it's emphatic. And the sages say that God is shown us that our sin of spiritual adultery is like a double sin. I'm gonna hide, I'm gonna hide my face, I'm gonna hide my face. He said it twice. Say, what you've done is so bad, it's like a double sin. And I'm showing you, I'm gonna hide my face, I'm gonna hide my face. That's what it uh, says in the, the Midrash. And you know what, there are times when God does hide his face. And there are times when God hides his face and we don't even realise he's doing it. And that's when we dwell in darkness and we think we're in the light. That's a dangerous place to be. That's what the, uh, the sages say is a double galoot. It's a concealment within a concealment. You know, you said recently, um, didn't you say, touch on something that recently, Joe? where people actually believe they're doing right and that they're in the darkness. Mm. You know, it's a dangerous place to be. I think Jackie said it was about having the deception in your own heart, wasn't it? Yeah, it was in, it was in the last Torah post. Um, the scripture says, um, don't, um, so, so I'll just paraphrase, don't bless your own heart, those who bless their own heart and the, the wrongdoing. Yeah. You know, and you've got many examples in the Bible, haven't you, of Pharaoh hardening his own heart. Yes, and, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think C there was a C.S. Lewis quote as well. Um, the Christian author. Yeah, yeah, he was a Christian author, and it was something along the lines of those who are most dangerous, who who, um, who basically believe that believe they're doing right, but but it, it, sorry, that that was it. Come back to me. They have the conscience of their own heart. They have the approval of the conscience of their own heart when they're wrongdoing. It's so, a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Yeah, when you've got the approval of your own conscience, because yeah. you can turn even the most, you know, you, you believe you're doing it. You yeah. think, yes, I'm all, I'm all in. This is, this is must be from God. This is what's we're seeing here. You yeah. think you're in the light, but you're actually in the darkness. Wow. It's a double concealment, and this is why our Lord says, "Twice I hide my face, I hide my face." But why did He hide His face? 
Well, it's written because of our spiritual adultery, we went seeking after other gods. So we had to hide his face. It's like if anyone has ever been in a relationship where their partner has cheated on them, you can't even bring yourself to look at them. You know, and so many of us have, have, have experienced that. Even people online or on a Zoom or here in the room, if your partner's, you've been in a relationship, it's quite close, you think it's, you know, serious, it's right, and that partner cheats upon you, you can't even bring yourself to look at them. Wow. You know. Sometimes you can't even utter the name, oh, she, or he, or they. You can't even utter the name. You don't want to get them the privilege of even uttering their name, but you don't. You can't even bring yourself to look at them. But our Lord, He may hide His face, but He still watches over us and He still loves us. Our God is long suffering and forgiving and loving. He's higher than us, you know. And truly, our God never forsakes us, or does He? As we read here. I will forsake them. We read this in the past. It says, I, I will never forsake you. And it says, I will forsake them. So you think, well, does he forsake? Or does he not forsake? Because both is written. But the, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So the truth is here somewhere. So I want to tell you the story. Does everyone remember Max Bygraves? I want to tell you a story. Well, it's actually, it's not a story. It's an anecdote. It's an anecdote, okay? Um, forgive me for mentioning football again, but when I was young and I was a lad and I went to the, the cup final to see Liverpool play and um, on the way there I got caught stealing. We all, people just, I was on the coach and we'd all get off the coach and we used to practically ransack <laughs> whichever shock we were at, you know. I was only young, I've repented. Um, but I got caught stealing. I was arrested. I was put in a cell, a police cell. I'm only, I'm 13, 14, you know. They could have just let me go. I mean, I look back on that now and think, you shouldn't do that to a child, really. You should have just warned him, took, took whatever had stolen off me and put me back on the coach. But anyway, they put me in a cell. And I missed the game. So I missed the game. And then sometime during the night, they took me out of the cell and they put me on another coach that was going back uh, to, to where I lived in Liverpool. So um, I get home and I'm thinking, you know, my mum and dad don't know what's happened. So I lied as to why I'm so late, you know, because I should have been on a much earlier coach coming back home. So I've got home and I've lied as to why I'm so late. Uh, but I was unaware that the police had already phoned home and informed them of what had gone on. Right. So I'm, th <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, you know, right. I've, got to, I've got to be with this. And uh, little, I'm speaking all this to them and they're thinking, yeah, really? Mm. Not what the police said on the phone. Go on, keep going. Anyway, <laughs> so they were aware of everything. Yeah. By the way, I've still got the unused ticket, you know. It's, um, and and the match ended in a draw, and I went to the replay and we won. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you say cheats don't always prosper, but now and again they get through, they get through the net. I got through the net. But, but back to the point. Back to the point. When I realised, oh, because he said, oh, well, that's funny, because the police rang at six o'clock or whatever time it was, went, oh, and it, me, me whale just fell out of me. <laughs> and I thought, oh, OK. So I thought, right, I'm in trouble, and I'm waiting for the backlash. I'm waiting for the backlash now. Uh, but it didn't come. There was no backlash. I didn't get told off. Uh, and I'm waiting, thinking, what's, come, what's going on? What, you know? And then I spoke to my mum, because my mum was easier to speak to than my dad. And my mum said, oh, your dad's washed his hands off you. I said, washed his hands off me? Oh. Um, I, I think it was really the first time I'd heard that phrase, but I knew straight away what it meant. Oh, your dad said he's washed his hands off you. Oh. Uh, what it was, my dad was so disappointed in me. And, and think what we're speaking about here, our, our God and his beloved people, OK? This is the anecdote you've heard into. My dad was so disappointed in me that... Um, He couldn't even speak to me or acknowledge me. As far as he was concerned, I should have gone to him and told him the truth. But the only truth is, I let him down, and my mum, of course. He was so upset that he wouldn't even speak to me or even acknowledge me for days. I, I, it might have been a week, might have been three or four days. 
He didn't even look at me. I had been disowned. He expected, and correctly so, rightly so, he expected me, uh, he expected loyalty, honesty and obedience from me. No, his child, and rightly so. But my behaviour wasn't <coughs> compatible with this. My behaviour wasn't compatible with his expectations, with his just expectations, you know. I'm looking back, I know that he loved me and he was still watching over me, obviously. So he had forsaken me, but he hadn't forsaken me. You see what I'm saying? He never stopped loving me. And this is how I see this partial. When God says he will not forsake us, and then he says he will forsake us, I see it in the same line as this. It's funny how things that happen to us in life, years down the line, it might be weeks, it might be months, it might be years and years and years. And they go bing, and it suddenly all makes sense, you know. And that experience that I had, I had then, I can share it with everyone here now. And really, it's what our Lord's doing with his people, you know. He loves them, he cares for them, but he just had to turn his face, you know. We had to learn a lesson. Yeah, it's like the Lord desires to feel the experience of being forsaken, but that's actually with the intent that we return and turn back. Yeah. So your dad probably went mute on you and was expecting you to feel the brunt of, of the consequence, but he, he ultimately loved you and wanted you to of be reconciled. Yeah, of course. But he wanted you to experience what that... Yes. Uh, what, what, the, it what it felt like, yeah, yeah. to turn away. Because that turned away from my dad, you know? We turn away from our father. He says, look, this is how it feels. This is how it feels, I'll turn away now. That's how it feels, and it's not good. And then we can't go blaming our oh God when he turns his face away because we turned away first. He has to. And it's for, our, it's for our benefit. That's how his love works. And through our lack of loyalty and our obedience and truth, we hate and we anger and we disappoint God. You know? It hates God, it angers him and it disappoints him. And yet, he's still... Sorry, Mark. Say it would be worse of a father not to discipline you. Truly, where's the love? Yeah, where's the love? Where's the love? He, he loves or he disciplines those he loves. Yes. So you know, if he doesn't yeah. discipline you, where's the love? Thank you, bro. Yeah. So we can hate and anger and disappoint God, and we often do, and yet He still forgives us and loves us, and I often think. What kind of God is this that we serve? Such unfathomable love, truly, you know. Do we merit this, really? And we see in verse 21, I know the inclination of their behaviour today, even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to them. So even, he still loves us, even though he knows you're going to turn away and do stupid stuff and bad stuff. Even before I brought them to the land which I swore to give them, I know the inclination of their behaviour. That's, that's, that's a deep, immeasurable love, you know. So, yet he sometimes does hide his face from us. But only after we first turn from him. You know, we, we like to recite the Aaronic lesson, don't we? And when we say, may God lift up his face upon you and make his face shine upon you, Maybe we should remember first not to hide ourselves from him, not to turn our face from him, you know. Bear that in mind when we're doing it on a blessing. May God lift up his face upon you. May, may his face shine upon you. Maybe you should remember not to first hide ourselves from him. So God's love, it's immeasurable. And he knew beforehand that we would be wicked and adulterous. He still continued to love us. He's never stopped loving us. The Bible is proof. The Bible is proof. God never stops loving us. Thanks, brother. Yeshua is proof. He gave his life for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. Our own lives are proof. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just thinking about the Garden of Eden. About, um, Adam and Eve and the Father. And what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, you know, um, when they were hiding and the, fa and the Father said, where are you? He obviously knew where they were. Yes. Obviously, where are you in yourself? Where, where are, are you? you? Yeah. What's going on kind of thing? Yes. You? And obviously there was a, a big consequence to their actions. 
and God had to react to their actions. Beautiful, so. beautiful. So it's nothing new. It's nothing new. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. God's never stop loving us. The Bible's proof. Yeshua's is proof. Our lives are proof. One more point here. When God says twice he will hide his face in the Hebrews, Hester Panim. Hester Panim. He'll hide his face from his people because of their sins. This doesn't indicate a lack of divine providence or divine love. Just the concealment of it. That's what's important here. He hasn't stopped loving us. Or being interactive in our lives it just conceals it and we can see this happen even today when we think about it God's maintained a state of being concealed from our non-messianic Jewish brothers and sisters you know uh, rather like Joseph remember the story of Joseph yeah. when it was he was the saviour but they didn't recognise him yeah. you know he's concealed it's a similar thing here and yet we know that he's revealed through Yeshua. And hallelujah, hallelujah. And one day the whole world will know. Back a couple of verses to 19. We're nearing the end now, folks. Uh, we're going to go through in one go. Yeah, verse 19. It's about the... Uh, write down this song for yourselves. This song is meant as a proof to the, to the people, to the Israelites, that God warned them in advance what would happen. And they think, well, why would he put it in a song? And like we said at the outset before we began the Parsha, the Torah would have been sung. There's something about singing. You know, we experienced this at the, before we began the Parsha when we were singing worship. There's something about singing the word. There's something about it. But even down to daily, nitty gritty, daily life, why a song? Well, a short, another brief anecdote. About 50 odd years ago, I remember sitting in front of the telly with my cousin who was staying over the night and we're both singing along with the television. Chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep. Yeah. Right, the, older, the older ones will remember that. The younger ones may have heard the song, but we're singing along on the couch. I can picture it now. Chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep. An absolute load of nonsense. But we were singing it with only five, six, four. No, yeah, something like that. Um, and that's from 50 odd years ago. Now, you asked me what I had for my tea two nights ago. I'm thinking, oh, well, what did I have? I can't remember. But songs stick in your head, don't they? Now, so there's a reason why certain things are, are delivered in a poem or a song, for example, and it's sung. It's catchy. It's easy to memorise. And we're supposed to memorise what's going on here. You know? But, um, so the, the children would learn this song. The song of Moses and the children would learn it. So imagine, right? The children are singing a song and their parents are feeling convicted because it's there as a witness against them. You know, there's, there, the kids are walking around singing them. They have corrupted themselves. A perverse and crooked generation. And you're thinking, will you shut up? You know, <laughs> what are they singing here? This is us. And think, Lord, you know, it just makes me think. I think it's for a reason. You know, it's, it's given in song. The kids have to learn it, and the kids are singing it, saying, oh, well. and So we think, well, imagine the kids constantly singing a song that reminds you of your sins against God, you know. And this is probably only one of the reasons, there's probably many more, of why it was this way. And we know how it works, don't we? It's happened to all of us. When you hear a song, usually it's one that you can't stand. You know, it's a song that you can't stand and you hear it. And next minute it's in your head and it's just going over and over in your head and you think, oh. And then you're humming it and the words are haunting you thinking, well, get out of my head. You know, be careful with the radio, folks. It's deliberate, by the way. Yeah, this nonsense just goes over and over. So you're humming it and the words are haunting you. Well, you imagine the kids singing that song and just getting convicted all the time. Well, yes. So what would we say to the kids if you heard them singing the song and it was just reminding you of your sins against God and they're just singing it all the time in the playground, in the house, in the bedroom? Would you say, well, yes, shut up? Or would you just actually say, you know what? The kids are right. Praise God for revealing it to them and now let us repent. You're always given a choice, aren't you? you know. Would you tell them to shut up or would you actually acknowledge that they're right and we should repent? And there's another lesson here. 
Yeah, we are to teach our children. But sometimes, you know what? They can teach us too. We can learn things from our children, from children in general, you know. We have to be honest enough and uh, humble enough to acknowledge it, that sometimes we can learn from children. So this prediction that the people would abandon the Torah and would be punished for their sins says uh, as a witness both for God and for the people. For the people in that they've been forewarned of the consequences of their actions. They've been forewarned. It's a witness against them. You've been forewarned. So there's no excuse. And for God himself, that God wouldn't be too harsh on us because he already knew. He foresaw and said, I know their inclination and what they do even now before I brought them into the land. So it was a witness for us and also for our God whose loving mercy and kindness doesn't end. So God already knew and yet he's never stopped loving us. For almost 7,000 years, he has been long suffering to put up with us. Now that is love. Okay, we're drawing to the end of the uh, we're drawing to the end of the parsha now. We're going to conclude shortly. Verse twenty-one. This song will testify against them as a witness. It's another way of saying that God will pre-warn them concerning all the things that are now befalling them. And consequently, when they hear or read this song, they will not be able to claim, "Well, if we had known, we wouldn't have transgressed." Well, you did know, and you transgressed. So there's no excuse. That's what it's there for. And where it says, it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants, i.e. their offspring, their children. This is a promise from God to the people that the Torah will never be forgotten. It goes on. To the offspring, to the generation. It's perpetual. It's endless. Hallelujah. So to conclude, Vayelech, and he bent, and Moses bent. Went where? Wherever God said. I want to reiterate, when we awake in the morning, it's a brand new day. It's creation again. It's recreation. We ought to give Yah thanks and praise for life. And then live it as if it were our last day on earth. We should treat others as if it's the last time we will see them. You might not get another opportunity to do so. Let's bless others, uplift others with love and with God's truth, just as Moses did. Very few people who have ever lived will know the day that they're going to die. Moses knew. Yeshua knew. Whether we know or not, we must do what is right to the very end. We read in Matthew and Mark, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Moses endured to the end. And even in his final hours, Yeshua healed and prayed, spread the gospel, loved, forgave, even while on the cross. Let us live every day as if it were our first and last. Live for God, live for others, like Abraham, Moses and Yeshua. I'll end with this verse, Hebrews 12, 1. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's Pasha Vayelech. Have a blessed week. Vaya con Dios. Shabbat shalom.